Our opening words this morning are by Jane Malden. For our community gathered here, for the spirit that called us together and drew us to this place, we give thanks this day. For moments we have shared with others, for times when we have reached out across barriers of distance and fear, for times when others have reached out to us, for moments when we have discovered another along our path, we give thanks this day. For this community of celebration and growth, introspection and solitude, and for those moments of that peace which passes all understanding, we give thanks this day. For our gathering together out of distant places, for our weaving together out of many separate selves, this hour of celebration and worship, we give thanks this day. Let us quiet ourselves in the spirit of prayer. After our spoken prayer and a time of silent meditation, we will sing together Spirit of Life, which is printed in your order of service. Spirit of Life, Spirit of Love, Breath of the Universe, God of our heart's longing, be with us now in this moment of prayer. We lift up in our hearts and prayers all who need to know that someone is praying for them right now. Who, sensing this connection to others and feeling the energy of our warm thoughts, might gain the strength to persevere. Surround our loved ones, our community, and those we do not even know with the strength and love being generated in this room right now. Carry our prayers out from this building on the wind. Wind our caring thoughts around those who are hurting, those who are healing, those who are angry or confused. Weave our compassion thread by thread into the world we live in. Create community with our growing kindness and patience. Build a beacon of light with our intentions and hopes. Spirit of life, Take this energy and use it where the world needs it most. Together we will build the beloved community. Amen. Our readings this morning come from the This I Believe series which is an international project engaging people in writing and sharing essays describing the core values that guide their daily lives. Over 100,000 of these essays, written by people from all walks of life, are archived on the This I Believe website, heard on public radio, and chronicled in the This I Believe books. This project is based on the popular 1950s radio series of the same name, hosted by Edward R. Murrow. I've invited Wave and Cricket to share two of these essays with you this morning. This reading is titled, The Connection Between Strangers, and is by Miles Goodwin, real estate attorney and Vietnam veteran. On June 23, 1970, I had just been mustered out of the Army after completing my tour of duty in Vietnam. I was 23 years old um, and a veteran on a plane home from Oakland, California, returning to Dallas, Texas. I had been warned about the hostility many of my fellow countrymen felt towards returning 
Nam vets at this time. There were no hometown parades for us when we came home from that unpopular war. Like tens of thousands of others, I was just trying to get home without incident. I sat in uniform in a window seat, chain smoking and avoiding eye contact with my fellow passengers. No one was sitting in the seat next to me, which added to my isolation. A young girl, not more than 10 years old, suddenly appeared in the aisle. She smiled and without a word, timidly handed me a magazine. I accepted her offering, her quiet welcome home. All I could say was, thank you. I do not know where she sat down or who she was with because after accepting the magazine from her, I turned to the window and wept. Her small gesture of compassion was the first I had experienced in a long time. I believe in the connection between strangers and when they reach out to one another. Since then, I have followed her example and tried in different ways for different people to do the same for them. Her offer of the magazine to a tired, scared, and lonely soldier has echoed throughout my life. I have to believe that my small gestures have the same effect on others. And to that little girl, now a woman, I would like to make this, take this opportunity to say again, thank you. Peace begins with one person by Ivory Harlow, waitress, student, U.S. Air Force veteran. I serve coffee at a counter-style diner in Texas. I often see a look of isolation in my customers' eyes. They come in the front door, wander to the counter, pick up the menu, and look around the diner for something they can't short order a connection. In this age of online chat, online shopping, and online school, it's no wonder people come into the diner starving for human connection. One day, a woman who had been sitting in the corner booth for at least three hours asked me, how much is one breakfast taco? I told her that I didn't know that I would go find out. Going back to the kitchen, I thought about her, how she looked down and out. And when I came back, I offered her a free pancake breakfast. I fibbed that it was a leftover from an order I had messed up. She asked to borrow bus fare and promised to return and pay me back. I handed over a tip money from my apron pocket. Three weeks later, she returned my two dollars and she offered to buy me breakfast on my break. This kind of thing gets me wondering if something as simple as a short order stack of pancakes can bring about a small shift in society. I'll go even further. Can one act of friendliness start to generate peace? I believe it can. Peace begins with one person and spreads like warm syrup. When it connects, when I connect with my neighbors, they return it in kind. So yes, I believe in friendliness and an open ear. For me, it starts with making eye contact when I pour coffee for my customers and I ask, how you doing? 
and then listen for their answer. My job is to take care of customers at the counter in a small Texas diner. But I also believe that we are in this world to take care of each other. This month I've been reading a book called Hello, Goodbye, Hello. A Circle of 101 Remarkable Meetings by Craig Brown. The premise of the book is a fascinating one. In 1,001 words each, Brown recounts 101 meetings between the famous and the infamous. In an interconnecting circle, he spans hundreds of years of chance meetings and longed for encounters. Some last just a moment, others hours of conversation. But each true encounter is summarized in just 1,001 words. A particularly interesting section runs from Mark Twain in 1909 to Jackie Kennedy in 1986 like this. In 1909, Mark Twain befriends Helen Keller and is blown away by this amazing blind and deaf 14-year-old girl. Inspired, he ends up sponsoring her education. At the age of 72, Helen Keller meets the grand dame of modern dance, Martha Graham, who teaches her what it means to jump by having her hold her hands on the waist of a male dancer who stands at the bar leaping over and over again. Keller gets a huge smile on her face as she experiences dance for the first time. Oh, how wonderful, she says. How like thought. How like the mind it is. Martha Graham heads up her famous dance school on East 63rd Street in which the 19-year-old would-be artist Madonna enrolls upon arriving in New York City. Dying to meet the dance legend and formidable owner of the school, Madonna finally runs into Graham in the hallway as the teen sneaks out of a dance class to go to the bathroom, which is frowned upon. Their entire encounter consists of an accusatory look. Until years later, when Martha Graham's dance school is on the brink of bankruptcy, and the now world-famous pop star Madonna sends a $150,000 check to save it. Upon receiving the check, 94-year-old Martha Graham bursts into tears. Madonna then goes on a fabricated and awkward date with Michael Jackson. The two do not get along. He gets along better with Nancy Reagan on a visit to the White House. Nancy wants Jackson to donate his song, Beat It, for advertisements against drunk driving. To, to his face, Nancy is polite, but in private she finds him very strange. I just wish he would take off those sunglasses, Nancy tells a staff member. Nancy later has an awkward interview with Andy Warhol, who, as it turns out, has been snubbed by and holds a grudge against Jackie Kennedy. At the Cape Cod wedding of Arnold Schwarzenegger and Maria Shriver, the two do not acknowledge each other. It was an interesting read. Certain of the stories really got me thinking, especially one about John Scott Ellis, who, out for a spin in his brand new car in 1931 in Germany, accidentally hits a pedestrian who is knocked to the ground, but gets up again. The pedestrian is Adolf Hitler. 
If I had killed him, it would have changed the history of the world, says an awestruck Scott Ellis years later. Reading this book has got me thinking lately about chance encounters that although they may not have changed the history of the whole world, have changed our own smaller worlds. Of course, the events of last week have extended my thinking to include chance events that have changed people's lives in very negative ways as well. Imagine going to the Boston Marathon to watch a friend cross the finish line and waking up with an amputated limb. The repercussions will ripple out from that horrible event for years to come. I think we are all struggling with some of the fear that comes with being reminded that we live in a world of chance, randomness, and unexpected carnage. But there are also the chance encounters that bring hope, grace, and joy to our lives. Little girls handing us magazines, or a waitress lending bus fare from her tip money. The challenge, then, is to remain open to a world, to a universe, to a God, that brings us both. We never know what our day has in store for us. My colleague in Marblehead, Reverend Wendy, shared this story with me. Wendy works with a lot of special needs children and young adults through their involvement with the Special Olympics. She teaches swimming. The students she works with face myriad challenges, not just the physical competition and their physical limitations, but also many social challenges, behavioral challenges, and quite simply, fitting in in a world that sees them as different and somehow less than. One of Wendy's favorite students was Dara Bell. Dara had no sense of personal boundaries as you or I do. She was an extremely happy child and person and just loved the world and everyone in it. When she saw someone, she would get so excited, she would jump up and down and flap her hands as if at any moment she might take off, leave this earth in her joy. Frequently, this was followed by a full speed charge and an enormous hug likened by Wendy to a vice-like grip. The hug could last quite a while. Although with her family and friends, this show of affection was endearing, in the wider world, it got her into trouble. Dara was indiscriminate in her hugging, which made running errands with her interesting. Before each, each trip to the store, Dara's mother would coach her on etiquette. Stay with me, she would say. Give people their space and no hugging strangers. Dara would agree. She loved running errands. At the store, Dara's mom would give her concrete tasks. Go down this aisle and get one can of beans, she would say. Dara would skip down the aisle on her mission. Shopping with Dara could take hours, but it brought her great joy. One particular day, with just one more item on the grocery store list to find, Dara's mom was beginning to breathe easier, thinking they had escaped incident that day, when she sent Dara down the empty aisle for that last box of cereal. All of a sudden, a woman came around the corner at the other end of the aisle. 
Before she could do anything to stop it, Dara's mother watched her daughter take off at a sprint toward the unsuspecting shopper. Dara bulldozed into the woman and in two seconds had her wrapped in one of her vice-like body hugs. Dara's mother ran down the aisle to rescue the woman who, to her surprise, was hugging the girl back tightly. Dara, honey, let go, let go, her mother coaxed. But Dara's grip didn't loosen. I love you, she said to the woman in her arms. I love you too, whispered back the woman. And Dara's mother noticed that there were tears streaming down her face. A full three minutes later, Dara released the woman from the hug, and Dara's mom began apologizing profusely. The woman held up a hand and interrupted. You don't understand, she said. This morning, I decided to kill myself. I felt so alone. That hug was the best thing that has ever happened to me. I think it saved my life. If we, in our fear, close ourselves off to the unexpected offerings of the universe, we may protect ourselves from some hurt, but we will also miss the gifts in the grocery store aisle. Perhaps instead of buffering ourselves from an unpredictable world, we can try to channel Dara just a bit in our interactions, just enough to receive some of her openness, some of her lack of judgment, and her appreciation for the companionship of others. Chance meetings can change our world, bless our lives. The other story along this theme that I want to tell you this morning relates back to that sermon I gave a few weeks ago called Listening for Our Song. To truly listen for our song, to hear the truth of who we are and can be in this world, we need to remain open. Now, I have always thought of this learning our song idea that comes from that David Blanchard reading I shared with you on a metaphorical level. But the other day, I learned of this story where this same theme is embodied in a literal song. The story comes from Leonard Cohen, from his acceptance speech at the Spanish Prince of Asturias Award Ceremony. He is trying to tell the Spanish people why he feels a deep sense of gratitude to them and why his music is in part theirs. He begins by telling the audience how influenced he has been by the poet Federico Garcia Lorca. Sometimes our chance encounters can be with words. When I was a young man, said Cohen, I hungered for a voice. I studied the English poets and I knew their work well and I copied their styles, but I could not find a voice. It was only when I read, even in translation, the works of Lorca that I understood that there was a voice. It's not that I copied his voice, I would not dare, but he gave me permission to find a voice, to locate a voice, that is, to locate a self and a self that is not fixed, a self that struggles for its own existence. Already, this is enough of a story for me, but he goes on. And so I had a voice, he says, but I did not have an instrument. I did not have a song. 
And now I'm going to tell you, he says, a story of how I got my song. Because I was an indifferent guitar player, I banged the chords. I only knew a few of them. I sat around with my college friends, drinking and singing the folk songs and the popular songs of the day, but I never in a thousand years thought of myself as a musician or as a singer. One day in the early 60s, I was visiting my mother's house in Montreal. Her house was beside a park. I wandered back to this park which I'd known since my childhood, and there was a young man playing a guitar. He was playing a flamenco guitar, and he was surrounded by two or three girls and boys who were listening to him. I loved the way he played. There was something about the way he played that captured me. It was the way I wanted to play, and knew that I would never be able to play. And I sat there with the other listeners for a few moments, and when there was an appropriate silence, I asked him if he would give me guitar lessons. He was a young man from Spain, and we could only communicate in my broken French and his broken French. He didn't speak English. But he agreed to give me guitar lessons. I pointed to my mother's house, which you could see from the park, and we made an appointment and settled a price. He came to my mother's house the next day and he said, let me hear you play something. I tried to play something and he said, you don't know how to play, do you? He said, let me show you some chords. And he took the guitar and he produced a sound from that guitar that I had never heard. And he played a sequence of chords with a tremolo and he said, now you do it. I said, it's out of the question. I can't possibly do it. He said, let me put your fingers on the frets. And he put my fingers on the frets. And he said, now, now play. It was a mess. He said, I'll come back tomorrow. He came back tomorrow. He put my hands on the guitar and I began again with those six chords, a six chord progression. Many, many flamenco songs are based on them. I was a little better that day. The third day improved, somewhat improved, but I knew the chords now. And I knew that although I couldn't coordinate my fingers with my thumb to produce the correct tremolo pattern, I knew the chords. I knew them very, very well. The next day, he didn't come. He didn't come. I had the number of his boarding house in Montreal. I phoned to find out why he had missed the appointment. And they told me that he had taken his life. He had committed suicide. I knew nothing about the man, said Cohen. I did not know what part of Spain he came from. I did not know why he came to Montreal. I did not know why he played there. I did not know why he took his life. I was deeply saddened, of course. But now, said Cohen, I disclose something that I've never spoken in public. It was those six chords. <laughs> It was that guitar pattern that has been the basis of all my songs and all my music. So now you will begin to understand the dimensions of this gratitude I have for this country. Thank you, Spain. It goes like this, the fourth, the fifth, the minor fall, the major lift, the baffled king composing Alleluia, 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 Alleluia. Hello, good
goodbye, hello, opens with a short poem. Tossed upon ocean waters, two wooden logs meet. Soon a wave will part them, and never again will they touch. Just so are we, our meetings are momentary, my child. Another force directs us. Call it destiny or providence. Call it chance, kismet, synchronicity. Call it the universe looking out for us. Call it God. Call them angels. Whatever has brought those moments of connection and grace, those hello, goodbye, hellos, those life-changing interchanges that may last only a moment or the length of three guitar lessons, those people who we meet accidentally, who change our lives forever, thank you. Thank you. And may we be open to these moments in our lives, these people. May we not miss them or their lessons. I believe we must be open to the chance encounters that can change the world and already have. Amen. Blessed be. Hallelujah.